Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our first Science Speaker Series event of the 2021 spring semester. It's my pleasure today to introduce Dr. Angel Tanner from Mississippi State University. Um, Angel started her career um, as a PhD student at uh, UCLA, working with Dr. Andrea Gez, who won last year's Nobel Prize in Physics uh, for the work that they began on the black hole in the center of our galaxy. Um, Angel took her knowledge of orbits and has been working on exoplanets um, quite a bit ever since her work on the galactic center and the uh, stars orbiting this uh, black hole. But today she's going to tell us all about uh, how they got started and how we've gone uh, from understanding these orbits of stars going around the center of the Milky Way to understanding the black hole and the general relativity of the uh, environment. And so thank you, uh, Angel, for coming and joining us today. And uh, thank you, everyone, for tuning in to our Science Speaker Series. And with that, I'll hand it over. Okay. Hello, everyone. Um, uh, everybody can hear me okay, Noel? Yes, I'm still good? Just to check. Okay. Uh, thank you, Noel, for inviting me to, uh, to give this talk. It's an exciting time, uh, not just to be studying what I study right now, extrasolar planets, but also to have been a part of the center research that I did at UCLA. So, of course, yeah, a lot of this has to do with some sort of mystery object that was lurking at the center of our galaxy, lurking at the center of our galaxy, and I'll sort of start off a tour uh, of the center of our galaxy, and we're going to zoom in, looking at different wavelengths of light and different spatial scales, and then we'll get to the black hole at the center of the galaxy. So this is a beautiful image that I have to say has never actually been published that I took of the center of the galaxy using fairly long infrared wavelengths and the Keck telescope. So this is kind of a false color image. Your eyes wouldn't be able to see at this wavelength because this is at infrared wavelengths, which are longer than optical light. But sure enough, the black hole is roughly about here in this image. Okay, so here's a, a cartoon of our Milky Way galaxy. So we're in the Milky Way galaxy. And so it's kind of hard to see what it looks like because we're in it. Um, but this is what we think it looks like. This is one of the more recent cartoons that someone's produced. And... Uh, we have an arrow here to where the sun is. The sun's about two thirds of the way from the center of the galaxy. We're in a spiral galaxy. And there's been all these historical names that have been given to the different spiral arms of our galaxy with us being what's called the Orion Spur. And uh, we've got the center of the galaxy here. Surprisingly enough, only in the past 15 to 20 years did we know that the center of the, the, the the center area of the galaxy, a much larger spatial scale than what we'll be zooming into, the, the center bulge of the galaxy has this elliptical shape uh, that they've called the galactic bar. I mean, 10 to 15 to 20 years of us realizing that, I was actually kind of surprised. I figured we'd known that already. We used to think that this was a more of a spherical shape, but now we think it's a bar. So that would kind of make us a barred spiral galaxy but we're still trying to figure a lot of this stuff out. Um, but yeah, so here's the sun in our solar system out here, two thirds of the way out. And the distance to the galactic center is about 24,000 light years away. Um, so here is a beautiful image uh, taken by a fairly famous uh, astrophotographer. Uh, and this looks like it's probably somewhere not too far from your neck of the woods. This looks very deserty. I forgot where he took it, unless it's over in another continent. Um, but I know this uh, individual, he, tend, he does take a lot of images from Arizona, with Arizona being a beautiful place for doing astrophotography. Uh, what Noel didn't mention, and that's totally okay, is that I did my undergrad at the University of Arizona, so I am quite familiar with uh, Arizona's beauty. And uh, this is a nice panoramic image of what the Milky Way would look like it will, does look like from the Earth. It's got this weird distortion, as usual, because you're taking a three-dimensional image and stretching it out into 2D. 
But you can see over here where the arrow is pointing, you kind of get a bright spot. That's Body's Window. And uh, you can kind of see there's a constellation here that's quite popular for those of us to pay attention to the Galactic Center. And this constellation looks like a teapot. There's the top of the teapot. There's the handle of the teapot. And there's a spout. And especially if you've got the dark skies of Prescott, um, or at least get out of town, you can even see there's kind of a little teaspoon up here too. Uh, so Sag and then we call this constellation Sagittarius, but the, the common name is the teapot because it looks like a teapot. So near here um, is, this is towards the center of the Milky Way galaxy. So you'll hear the word Sagittarius mentioned a lot, uh, or Sag for, start, for, for short in, in this presentation. So we're going to zoom in to a part of the sky that's about this big, and we're going to keep zooming in as I, give, as I give this talk. So here's another image of that part of the galaxy. Here's uh, Sagittarius kind of outlined. And again, because you are in a very dark, you have very dark skies available in, in Arizona, if you want to go out, even with a pair of binoculars, or maybe if... Uh, uh, Noel's got the observatory open whenever things get a little bit easier to do that. During the summer, Sagittarius is up. This is the, the most, the, it's up from roughly April to September are the most reasonable months to look at Sagittarius. But there's a lot of fun things to look at, even just around the center of the galaxy. Here's Body's window. Um, the Galactic Center actually isn't in this bright spot. It's actually over here. But there's lots of fuzzy things. There's some nebulae. I think some of these are globular clusters. Yeah, some, so uh, if you have a decent pair of binoculars or if you're lucky enough to get to go use some of the telescopes on campus, you can get some really pretty uh, views of some of these uh, objects. But um, the, the, between us and the center of the galaxy, sure, there's a lot of stars. But there's also a lot of dust, uh, not quite the same type of dust that you have in your house. It's quite some, well, somewhat similar, though, depending on the dust. Uh, most of the dust we have in our house is, of course, uh, little mites and skin cells, which is kind of gross. But uh, we do have, if you happen to be someplace where maybe there was a fire, if you're burning wood or something, you will get a lot of carbon. Uh, and that, that does make some of this dust. And this also has a lot of silicon in it, too. So those are some of the, the more like mineral-like dust that you have in our galaxy. But dust blocks light. I mean, unfortunately, I don't know if you guys have had a lot of um, forest fires lately, but whenever you have a really bad fire, it makes the sky very dark because this, this particular material is very good at blocking optical light. And that's true in our galaxy just as much as it is um, and just in our atmosphere. I'm checking. We can see where I have a clock. There we go. So the center of our galaxy, even though in that other image it appears that it's a big bright area, it's actually kind of dark where our galactic center is. There's a lot of dust in the area. So for that reason, the telescopes that we use, we can't look in optical light. We actually have to go to infrared. So over here on the right is that same part of the sky, but it's imaged at infrared wavelengths. Now you can kind of see where the center of the galaxy is. It is towards this, this sort of hub of bright lights. But you can still see these black splotches here, and these are still really thick dust clouds that are still blocking out some of the light. There are stars embedded in these clouds, and there are stars behind these clouds, but the clouds are still blocking the dust. So all of the work that's been done with the Galactic Center has been done at very long wavelengths of light. Infrared light, some of it's, you're gonna see some radio images. The image I had at the beginning of the talk, that was a mid-infrared image. So we have to do this at wavelengths that the human eye can't see, which is often a little bit weird. So here's a sense of scale of how big that image was uh, compared to the optical image. So we're zooming in more and more. Now, uh, a lot of the work that was done at the Galactic Center back in the 80s, before even my time, was done at radio wavelengths. So uh, the Galactic Center is one of the brightest 
objects in the sky at radio wavelengths. So these are the very long wavelengths of light that you would actually, the same types of wavelengths of light you would use to collect in your radio receivers back when we had analog. And now it's all done digitally. But um, so that's, it was one of the, so the Galactic Center being Sagittarius A or Sagittarius was one of the first things detected at radio wavelengths. The other thing is the sun. That's another source of radio wavelengths. And then there's a, an interesting galaxy out there called Centaurus. And now it's called Centaurus A. And it, it has its own black hole to deal with. But uh, eventually in the... So it was, it was first discovered in the 80s as being a big blob of radio emission. We didn't know what it was. Uh, but then we used amazing telescopes like the Very Large Array in Socorro, New Mexico, if you happen to go out there. Um, and this is an image taken with the Very Large Array. And because it's a gigantic radio telescope uh, that we can make a few kilometers across, we can get somewhat detailed images at radio wavelengths. And I'm going to zoom in on, on this in a second, but this big blob right here is Sagittarius A. So we knew something was going on at radio wavelengths at the Galactic Center uh, early on. So here's a zoom in of that. I think this is even the more uh, recent image that was taken just a few years ago. But here it's almost like overexposed towards the direction of Sagittarius A. But you can already see some weird stuff going on. There are these weird wispy things. Um, over here, the, we know what these are. These are the exploded leftover shells of dead stars. So these are supernova remnants. So this was a massive star that had an explosion. I do not appreciate the distance of these. I'd have to go check. These feel like these are kind of closer to us than the Galactic Center. Um, but they have, if you see these round things in these images, these are dead stars. And then I think I also point out, these are some weird objects that a lot of my friends at UCLA were studying when I was there as a grad student. And these are, believe it or not, are, are not only does the sun have a magnetic field, not only does our, our Earth have a magnetic field, thank goodness, because it protects us from the sun, but our entire galaxy has a magnetic field. And so these are these weird magnetic filaments that are produced by the galaxy's magnetic field. And that's a whole nother talk, which I'm not an expert in. But uh, yeah, we've, we've seen these move about and they have this weird structure and it's tracing out the magnetic field of the entire galaxy. So that's some pretty cool stuff. Um, and this, this stuff too is all related to all that. Lots of interesting structure that a uh, lot of those radio people, they study the heck out of. But we're zooming in still on Sagittarius A. So something is producing radio emissions at Sagittarius A. Oh, I just realized my buttons. Oh, here we go. So we're gonna zoom in even more. Um, so this is again, this is a radio image and they were able to use another version of the VLA where they could actually uh, focus on this part of the sky towards the center of the galaxy. And when they did, they got this structure here uh, when we looked a little bit closer. Maybe they didn't quite overexpose as much at radio wavelengths. Sorry, wrong button. Doop, there we go. And this is called the mini spiral. So this image is from 1993. And you see sort of this spiral shape here. This coming down here is called the Northern Arm. And I'll show that later because this is my thesis object. And then you see this structure and then you see this structure. But in addition to this weird spiral structure, and that kind of tells you there's some interesting physics going on if there's some sort of mathematical shape like a spiral, in addition to that, we had a little blob towards the center. This oval shape here is, again, the very strong radio source that is Sagittarius A star. So we're able to zoom in and see that this is indeed a very localized uh, and strong source. So this is in the early 90s. Every time. This is a more recent image taken with the VLA. A lot of this stuff I've been able to update 
Beautiful image, still taken at radio wavelengths, so very long wavelengths of light. And uh, so there's something going on. You can see some stars here, and then you have uh, the radio source at the center. Now, if we do go to infrared light, uh, let's see, am I able to, yeah, if I click this. In infrared light, we can see the stars. Um, if I go back, I mean, focus on the shape here. You've got this, you've got this, you've got that. And you can kind of almost, if you squint, you can see a little bit of that spiral shape. Let me tell you that the part we're really going to be focused on is going to be this little part uh, at the very, very center. So let's zoom in again. And so now we get uh, an, a pretty sort of a false color image because this is the infrared still. But we're now zoomed in even more. And I, let me tell you that I looked at the same set of stars for six years. So it, I, I know the pattern well. But there's a whole bunch of stars here. This is the IRS 16 cluster of stars. We've got some interesting red objects I'll talk about later on because those are my thesis objects. We have IRS 7, which is a big red giant star. IRS 3, that was a dust and shrouded star. And IRS 13, which I think was a pretty interesting uh, cluster of stars as well. And this was taken with the VLT telescope. Now, we're still zooming in, believe it or not, because we were able to, with the Galactic Center stuff, we were able to pinpoint the location of the radio emission. And it wasn't just coming from all of this. We spent a lot of time trying to narrow down where it was coming from. And we knew it was coming from this little area of stars right here. Now, you can see, or you can't see in this image, things are kind of blurry still even with a very large telescope. This telescope's eight meters across. So we still need to zoom in a little bit further. Um, I forgot why I showed that little image. I think that was just showing the radio image as well. So here we go, zooming in again. And now I gotta move, Noel, there we go. We're gonna put you so you're not in the way. Okay, there we go. And so to give you a sense of scale on, on the sky, uh, we kind of started off with things that were about the size of a full moon. But now this part of the sky we've zoomed into, we're just looking at the IRS-16 cluster. And then the, this is IRS-21. And we're really focusing in on this little cluster here of stars. This is now 0.1% of the width of the moon. So think about a full moon on the sky and chop it up into about 100 pieces. And this part of the sky would be would fit inside of one hundredth of the size of the moon. Um, even more, even less than that, more like a thousandth now that I think about it. And it really is comparable to if you take a grain of sand or maybe just take a little piece of sugar or salt and put it at the tip of your foot about arm's length, you'd be covering up that one little part of sky with just a little grain of salt or a grain of sand. So this is a tiny part of our night sky, which just tells you how much work astronomers have to do if, this, if there's this much interesting stuff in just this part of the sky. But this is kind of a special part of the night sky. Okay, so we're gonna zoom in a little bit more. Uh-oh, come on, click. Let me zoom, there we go. Um, and we were able to figure out that Sag A star, the radio emission was coming from here. So in the, early 90s, uh, Andrea Gez, she's my thesis advisor, um, they didn't quite have this pretty of an image because this is from 1998. So even based on other pictures I'll show you, we, they started applying for Keck time at the Keck telescope to go look and see what was going on with this part of the sky. And apparently, I don't remember this because I block out a lot of things, a lot. Uh, some of her very first telescope proposals were actually turned down. Um, they didn't think it would be a good idea. So I'm sure, she, you know, she didn't give up, which is a good thing to think about when doing any type of a science. Don't give up, don't listen to people when you know you're right, uh, be pigheaded. And um, she eventually got some telescope time. Maybe she went and got time on Lick. 
uh, was able to get some initial data. But uh, eventually we started looking at the galactic center. And what this is showing is an image with something called adaptive optics. So even though we're observing an infrared wavelengths, the atmosphere is still quite blurry. When you look up at the night sky, you see that stars are twinkling. So imagine if you take a paper, so it's all crumply and has a shape to it. What adaptive optics does is it has optics and some electronics uh, that measure the shape of that crumple. And it's really cool. There's a mirror that then makes a shape. It's called the deformable mirror. I definitely, maybe at Emory Riddle, they might do some of this because it's also used for spy satellites. Um, they're able to use this deformable mirror, and the deformable mirror makes an opposite shape of that crumpled light wave coming in. From the, from the, I was pondering, from the year of about 1996 onward, we kept going to Keck. After, after she finally showed that some stuff was going on, we started, we started getting lots of Keck time. And we were able to get many, many images of the Galactic Center. We finally ne we, we noticed that these stars were not staying put. They were moving around. And so we were able to track their movement um, over uh, a few tens of years. Uh, so these stars are indeed moving around, and they are, uh, turns out they're orbiting. So the star is where the radio emission is coming from. We don't see any light coming from the location of the star. We do see all these stars orbiting around this position. So what we realize is that and it is just Kepler's laws. Uh, it's uh, the period squared is proportional to the distance cubed. I think I had that right. Uh, from that, you can estimate the mass of the object that these things are orbiting around. And it turns out that it's not a normal object. Of course, you all know that it's got a mass of about three times, three million times the mass of the sun and we can't see any light coming from it. And so it's black, because it doesn't have any light coming from it. And so it's a super massive black hole, because um, and we were able to prove that pretty definitively uh, over the next few decades. And so that's one of the things that got, that got a lot of notoriety recently. So this is a uh, this is a meme that I made because of what happened in October. I originally gave this talk just for fun uh, in August, and then something exciting really happened in October, and uh, that was of course the Nobel Prize. So what happened in 1998? We published a paper, and it just showed these are the positions of in three different years. And this is just, but we weren't really able to figure out, and this is where we thought the radio J star is. So we could kind of tell stuff was going on, but most of these look like a straight line. Eventually, we were starting that some of them were starting to turn and actually make an orbit. So now we have, uh, this is a diagram showing the orbits that Andrea's managed to trace out here in 2020, or at least past year. And one of the stars, a very well talked about one, the SO2, and it's making this yellow elliptical shaped orbit. And it makes that orbit every 17 years. That's not 17 galactic center years, that's good old 17 Earth years. I've seen this thing go around Sag J star a few times. Good, mathematically. So we've been able to study the properties of this orbit pretty good. And that's where we're able to estimate the mass black hole. Um, and so now that we've measured the orbits of all these stars, they're all kind of buzzing around Sag J star like a bunch of bees in a beehive. There's no particular rhyme or reason to the orientations of the orbits. 
uh, but it's been super exciting. So basically, once you estimated the mass and what they're orbiting around, you deduce that there was a black hole here. And it's that won Andrea's Galactic Center group uh, the Nobel Prize last year. And that was super exciting in October when we found out. Um, I remember kind of knowing when they're going to make the announcement because it's in early October. And I remember waking up and I'd forgotten for a second that that was happening that morning. I'm sure she got a phone call. And then I realized, oh, my gosh, we won the Nobel Prize. I mean, we. She gets all the credit. Like, oh, I get to go to Stockholm. And then I realized, oh, crap, COVID. Sure enough, no trip to Stockholm. Um, so it was – I tried to – because of everything going on in, in October with COVID and everything, I definitely tried to ride the high as much as I possibly could. And that included making this meme um, that kind of went viral. But one – about all this is just noticing that the the techniques and the data and the everything that's changed over the past 25 years. So whenever I was there from 96 to about 2004, we had to use what was called speckle imaging. And let me that this, this um, in order to get this data, we would have to observe for about six hours throughout the night. That's only half of a night because the galactic center isn't up the whole night um and it would take me the person reducing the data about five hours to crunch all of it so we'd collect a bunch of images and i'd have to write code to actually combine all this data and it would take yeah it would take a long, long time that was still with the keck telescope but using a very old infrared camera that they've since retired. In 2004, they added adaptive optics, and they were able to image in like four minutes, <laughs> and they didn't have to do any of the data reduction that uh, all of us had to do in the earlier years. So it is. I want you to focus on how clear, crisper the images are. Um, so ours have a lot of fuzziness around them, and you can kind of see the central parsec stars. And then here, much less fuzzy, a little bit more, more clear. You can see this diffuse emission, that's real stuff, and you can see a lot more stars. And then they really started spending money, and they added the laser. So I kid you not, uh, on any given night, on the top of Mauna Kea in Hawaii, they shoot a really big laser up into the sky. They do have to avoid planes, of course, because this is not this is not the kind of laser you get with the little pin laser, which you should also not aim at a plane. But you guys know that because you're in a riddle. Um, this is a very powerful laser, so they definitely have to look out for planes, and they um, have to make sure not to hit any spy satellites. But with laser, now that we have laser-guided adaptive optics, they can make the image even clearer. And now I'm really jealous. In fact, you can even see what's called the diffraction ring around the stars. And that means that the optics, the image is almost perfect. Uh, they've completely removed out the effect of the uh, atmosphere. But you can even see that you can see even more stars here towards the galactic center. And they're trying to get as many stars as possible because the more stars you get, the better you're able to kind of characterize the product hole. Okay, so the black hole does other things. It does burp. I, you know, I was telling you that on average we don't see a lot of black hole itself, but it, that, that's not quite true. If we take all of our images over the past 20 years and we turn it into an animation, notice that it does eventually, we call it flaring. I like burping, but it's called flaring. And we think what's happening here, and this was taken at the infrared, is that this is actually the thing. So, Black holes do not wander through space gobbling stuff up, but stuff does come to it, and it's all about gravity. So think about it being like a spider at the bottom of the sand, and if a star gets too close, it orbits too close, and it gets stuck in the gravitational pull of the black hole, and some star actually does get ripped apart and gobbled, quote-unquote, by the black hole, and as a result, we do get some infrared emission. And so they over the past few years. 
And then there's some other cool stuff going on around the black hole. There's uh, some clusters, other clusters of stars. These are images taken with Hubble, actually, the Hubble Space Telescope. And there's something called the quintuplet cluster, which is, it's in the word, it's in the title. There's these five stars here. And uh, they actually, whenever you get really the V stars, it looks like little pinwheels because they're stars that are surrounded by dust. It's kind of cool. The Arches Cluster is another cluster of stars kind of in the neighborhood of the black hole. And then there's the Pistol Star, which this is one of the most massive stars we've discovered to date. Uh, Noel studies one of the other most massive stars known about to date. I don't care as much about the star. I like the nebula because I think it looks like a crawfish. Why they named it the Pistol Star, I do not know. It was a bad name for it. Um, but I'm from the South, so I see crawfish and everything. But why do we care about these? Well, the way stars form, even though these are in the neighborhood of the black hole, uh, the black hole, the gravity of the black hole does impact the way stars form in these clusters. And we've done studies and we've shown that these stars, these clusters tend to be overabundant in very massive stars. So mass made in these types of clusters <clears throat> compared to clusters in our backyard like the Pleiades right now. Still, yeah, in the night sky. So we're, we're excited about that because we're kind of studying how being in the presence of a can affect the formation of stars. <clears throat> now, my thesis, every once in a while, I would try to get Andrea to move the telescope a little bit over here. <laughs> Because my thesis objects were in the field of view of Sag A star. Um, but we discovered this, this object, IRS-21, there was something weird about it. Because it wasn't a beautiful little... Uh, in fact, you can kind of see it here. I think I'm trying to point a little arrow to it. These look like nice little points of light. And IRS-21, which is here it actually is spatially resolved. It's large, it's big and puffy. Now remember, this is 24,000 light years away. So this thing is big. And I measured it to be, I think it was like 2,400 astronomical units where the distance from the earth to the sun is one astronomical unit. So this thing would be bigger than our solar system by far. And I, so I, my thesis, and all these guys are similarly puffy. Uh, they were all resolved. And you can kind of almost see it here, uh, the fact that it has a bit of a horseshoe shape. So it turns out what all of these are, they're just stars that are in, in a river of dust and gas. So this thing's called the Northern Arm. And it's related to the black hole because th this material is falling towards the black hole. So it's all flowing in this direction. And once I was able to get much better images, I could see little bow shocks. All of them have little horseshoe shaped bow shocks to them, except for IRS 21, which mother nature decided to play a trick on me because the material's flowing away from our view. So it looks like a big ball because we're looking at the bow shock face on. But that was my thesis, figuring out all that stuff. Interesting. So it was a lot more work than it sounded like. <laughs> it sounds like, but uh, it's cool. Um, so lately, one of the reasons I think that they really that really put the Galactic Center Group to to get the Nobel Prize was some of the more recent work. So what happened is the past couple of years, the past few years is that star I mentioned before with an orbit of 17 years called SO2. Um, it came around and swept by the black hole again. And it got really close to the black hole. And this time Andrea was ready. She knew what to look for. So what they did was they observed SO2 a lot as it passed as its closest approach to the black hole was here in May 2018. Oh, yeah, which I vi I was visiting her that year. Uh, I remember her being in Hawaii when, when, when this was happening. 
And what they were doing is they were looking for, they were able, because you're in the presence of a black hole, they were actually looking for some of the telltale signs that Einstein predicted of what would happen to starlight if it passes really near a black hole. And one thing that happens is that the light gets reddened. It's called gravitational redshift. And the way to think about that is light is also a form of energy. And uh, higher energy light is blue and lower energy light is red. So you guys are in Arizona. Some of you probably go skiing. Some of you maybe even maybe ski in the woods if you're that skilled. I have in the past. And whenever you get too close to a tree, you get stuck in that little divot by the trunk of the tree. Um, that's happened to me. And imagine you're stuck. So let that divot around the trunk of the tree be the gravitational field of the black hole. Now, so you've hit the divot, you're stuck at the bottom of the divot, and you have to climb out. Well, and I did that. Hopefully you remember to take your skis off. And if you're not in very good shape, you climb out of the divot and you get tired, you lose energy. So that's extremely similar to what's happening to the light from the star. As the star passes close to the black hole, its light gets gravitationally redshifted, so the light loses energy and uh, turns red. And so they were able to measure this effect. And of course, there's a lot of really nasty math that goes, it's involved with this, but Andrea is a very bright person and she was able to make very specific predictions about what the light should do. And those predictions followed bang on. So they were very happy and they published a paper that said, hey, we predicted this was gonna happen to the light from SO2. That's precisely what happened to the light. And so that was yet another proof of Einstein's theory of general relativity. Uh, something that they've been doing this year, the past couple years to happen is that that the orbit of SO2 will precess. And that's what's being shown over here. It gets shifted a little uh, over time. And we actually do see that, and I'm almost done, we actually do see that for the orbit of Mercury around the sun. So it's been proven many times uh, for, or for Mercury going around the sun, but now they have some very definitive, although still initial proof of the precession or the movement of the orbit of SO2. So that's a cool thing that they're doing right now. We're actually, they're actually measuring the precession of SO2. So I think they've published a couple papers on this. But this, this, I think, was another piece of material, another proof of general relativity that helped to win the Nobel Prize last year. Okay, so what's happening in the future? Um, so right now, we're, they're building a telescope. We're, well, we're trying to build a telescope called the TMT, the 30-meter telescope. I think Andrea's going to have no trouble getting time on it. <laughs> she has no trouble getting time on the telescope now. Uh, but uh, yeah, they're getting lots of, they're going to get this nice big telescope. Keck is about 10 meters. The TMT is 30 meters. It's in the title. They'll probably rename it when they launch it. And so it's going to be a bigger telescope, so it's going to see even more stars. So what? So they've already they've been making these images. This is what the the stars that they see right now uh, at the Galactic Center with Keck, still the biggest telescope in the world. Um, but with the, the TMT, they're going to even get to see uh, more clearly, and uh, they're going to see a lot a lot more stars. So they're probably going to get up to a thousand stars orbiting around the black hole. So they're really good, and they're gonna be able to get closer. That's the, that's the super exciting part, is with the better resolution, they're gonna get to, I think she, I think she said just a few hundred Schwarzschild radii. Uh, so that's really close. The, the, if you wanna give a black hole kind of a size, roughly, a Schwarzschild radius is kind of the outer boundary of a black hole. So they're gonna be able to get even closer uh, to looking at the stars that are really buzzing around just the very, very center of the black hole. So sorry for the issues with my connectivity. I see my blue light is still blinking, so I'm gonna stay on my phone, but I think that is all I have to say right now for, for the Galactic Center stuff. It's, it was an exciting and a, a journey and a privilege. I actually, this is actually CGI that I attempted when I was in grad school of what was going on with the Galactic Center. I, I made this by hand with my with my own hands, uh, so to speak, CGI. 
here's the here's the there's an accretion disk kind of around the black hole. Here's that J star. Um, and I had a point and I forgot it. Here's the mini spiral. But yeah, it was a privilege to study the galactic center, and it looks like there's going to be a lot of interesting stuff happening with it uh, for the years to come. And I'm excited to to see what they, what they discover. Okay, that is all I have to say about uh, 25 years at the Galactic Center. So we can open up to questions. Thank you very, very much, uh, Angel, for a talk and for dealing with all of your technical <laughs> issues. I appreciate everything. <clears throat> uh, we actually uh, we didn't get very many questions during the talk, so I'm going to assume that you, that means that you did very well. But right. I uh, did want to... <laughs> Thank you for pointing out, um, if any of my research students were watching, uh, you pointed out the pistol star, which is, of course, a very interesting massive star there. But there, you also pointed out the quintuplet cluster, where there's five of our um, five of these well-known dusty uh, wolf ray stars. And uh, yeah. several, several of my students are working on dusty wolf ray binaries right now. And so I appreciate you uh, pointing those out. Um, it's an, an interesting case, Noel, because I have data. I took data when I was a grad student with with speckle interferometry, but yeah. then um, I did not realize Peter Tuttle, who's like an expert in uh, interferometry, was able to take that same data set and process it a little differently, and actually bring out the the pinwheel structure. So it just goes to show you know, look at your data different ways and you never know what you're going to discover. Yeah, exactly. So uh, there's always wonderful things hiding in the archives as well for these things. Yeah, exactly. <clears throat> um, well, let's see. Is there any questions? There was just uh, some thank you and uh, informative talks and uh, all that. So uh, with that, it's just a little bit before one o'clock here, so that we're coming up on an hour. And I just wanted to thank you again for coming and giving us a talk about uh, the Galactic Center and the work that you did in relation to it and helping us celebrate last year's Nobel Prize. Yay. Um, <clears throat> so uh, thank you very much, and I hope you have a wonderful day. Uh, and to everyone, stay warm with the cold weather right now. And uh, uh, thank you for joining our discussion today. Cool. Thank you, everybody. And if you ever have any other questions, feel free to, to email me or ask Noel or uh, anybody, and we'd be happy to uh, answer them. And I was supposed to get bonus points, because do not forget that we are all, I'm a little distracted, because my little thing was going off, because we are landing on Mars, like, any, <laughs> any second now. Yep. That's, that's all the beeping in my background, was pers Perseverance is landing on Mars. It's going to be on YouTube. It's going to be on NASA TV. Uh, <laughs> yeah, they, they've really done a lot of media. I have to say, JPL's finally caught up with the 21st century. They are all over the place. So I would really go ahead and tune in now because I'm assuming that they probably have a lot of cool video and interviews of what the mission has done so far. But I think landing is at 55 after the hour. So liter literally wheels Any down. Moment. Oh, in an hour from now, cross your fingers. <clears throat> and a lot of that work is being done in Arizona. U of A and that other school, ASU, um, are very, very involved with a lot of Mars research, I have to say. They have very big planetary uh, departments and they get a lot of money to, they build all the instruments, a lot of the instruments that are on the rovers. So you might see mm -hmm. some Arizona stuff there too. But that's super exciting and uh, yeah, I'm going to turn on the cable right now and go watch some Mars stuff. All right. Well, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Tanner, and for everyone that joined us. And have a great day. <laughs>